Professor, Professor Dawkins will take questions. Uh, we'll ask you to line up at the two microphones, introduce yourself, and concisely ask your question. Is it possible to have the house lights up a bit so I can see um, people are asking questions? Hello. Is this microphone on? I'm uh, Dr. Howell. It's good to have heard your talk. I really appreciated hearing this. I should like to hear more of you. Uh, because the more you talk, the more you convince me that there is a God and you crystallize our need for him. I'm glad I have some effect. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a scientist, I'm a bit disturbed that you would go on a tirade for 40 minutes against God. So could you and talk a bit more clearly? I can't quite sure. hear. Sure. As a scientist, I'm a bit upset by the fact that you would go on a 40-minute tirade against God and then begin talking of science as if to put the authority of science into what you said. But I do have a question about your long discussion about morality and it coming from the Bible. And that you, you accuse people, I suppose Christians, of saying that we get our morality from the scriptures. Um, but clearly this cannot be the case because humanity from every civilization throughout time has a sense of morality and clearly most of them have, had not, have not had access to the Bible. So I'm curious then um, what you think is the origin of this morality. If someone comes in here with a gun and begins shooting all of us, we would call that bad. Why? Why well, is that bad? Um, I think we probably agree that people don't, as a matter of fact, get their morality from scriptures, and that's what I was actually saying. People get their morality from somewhere quite other than the, than the scriptures, uh, and to the extent that they do get their morality from the scriptures, as I was saying, they pick and choose. Now, if you're asking me where we get our morality from, I think that's an extremely complicated question, and one that I'm very interested in. I've got a whole chapter on it in the book, which I didn't have time to read from. I think that a sort of bedrock of it probably comes from our Darwinian heritage as a kind of misfiring byproduct of our Darwinian past when we lived in small villages or small roving bands, which meant that we were surrounded by close kin, and that, as you no doubt know, uh, is one good prerequisite for the evolution of altruism under Darwinian rules. And also, in those small villages or roving bands, we would have been surrounded by people whom we are likely to meet again and again throughout our life, which provides the basis for the other main Darwinian reason to be moral or altruistic. That, I think, is the Darwinian origin. And I suspect that, although we no longer live in small bands, the same rule of thumb, rules of thumb, which were honed in our Darwinian past, are playing themselves out under the alien conditions of modern urban society. The rule of thumb used to be, be nice to everyone you meet, because everyone you meet is likely to be either a cousin and or somebody you're going to meet again and again, and therefore in a position to reciprocate. Darwinism doesn't forecast, doesn't suggest that we should be all wise and do what is actually going to be best for our selfish genes. Instead, it says that it builds into our brains rules of thumb which worked in our ancestral past. That rule of thumb, be nice to everybody, is still in our brains. It is a lust, which is rather similar to the sexual lust, which is still in our brains, even though we may use contraception and therefore are not actually using copulation to reproduce. The same rule of thumb persists, and that is also true of the lust to be good, the lust to be nice. That, I think, is the Darwinian origin but I think that it's become modified and refined through culture, through civilization, until it shows itself in the much more sophisticated and actually much more pleasant uh, rules for being nice that we see today. Wherever else it comes from, it certainly doesn't come from scripture, and that was the only point I was trying to make from that particular reading. Yes. Well, hello there. Oh, well, welcome to welcome to America. Uh, I, I'm, I've been reading your book. I, I've been reading your book, and I, I think you're a terrific writer. And I got to say, listening to you in person and that accent and everything, man, now I just think you're brilliant. <laughs> but um, I thought that'd be a bot, yes. I, I know. I, uh, well, it, it's it's Lynchburg. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I, I, am, I am a theist. Uh, you'll be disappointed to know. But uh, my, you know how uh, Bertrand Russell you know, said that uh, if he faced God, he'd ask, you know, where, you know, he didn't give enough evidence. Where was the evidence? And all that. Uh, a couple pieces of evidence that I, I would just kind of be interested to hear, hear what you think about. Um, pertaining to this uh, issue of ethics, I, I read this chapter on, on ethics in your uh, book. I found it interesting. Um, I mean, you were dealing with the, the origin of our moral sense, more so than, I think, the origin of morality itself. You, you'd probably agree, right? Um, so, so, you know, you, you still wonder, what is it about the world that makes some things, you know, uh, right and, and some things wrong? Some things good, some things bad. And, and you know, you, you want to retain the language of, of some things are evil. And, and you give a lot of religious examples. And I'm, I'm in agreement with you on some of that, you know. Uh, but if we're going to retain these categories, these very strong, you know, m moral categories, it, it seems to me that naturalism is going to be very hard pressed to kind of provide an account um, for, for where real good and evil would, would be. I mean, um, I'm not sure how, how entirely we can simply assert the existence of value without providing a, a yeah. deeper account for it. And, and one other, moral freedom as well. Uh, it seems to me that if uh, the naturalist is kind of um, shackled, you know, I mean, it, it, a naturalistic world, it would seem as if we're just bound and determined to behave just the way that we do. Mor if morality is all about ought and ought implies can, how can we ever do anything other than exactly what it is that we do? So I'd, I'd be real interested in your responses to those things. Well, I think it's a problem for all of us. I mean, not, not, not just for naturalists. I, know, I think it is actually fairly baffling where our morality comes from and why we're, we're in fact as nice as we are. I mean, the professionals in this field are moral philosophers and moral philosophers, the majority of them, are, are not theologically inclined. I mean, they tend to develop ideas, the simplest of all, the one, the one we all know about is the, is the golden rule, be, behave to others as you would wish they should behave to you. And moral philosophers have developed other such principles, um, uh, always oppose suffering, um, always uh, behave as if you didn't know whether you were going to be at the top of the pecking order or the bottom. These are all moral precepts which moral philosophers have developed. Now, it's a genuinely difficult question why any individual should wish to follow such moral precepts. If I ask myself, I, I'm actually a very moral person, I think, and I'm sure most of you are too. Um, if I ask myself why I don't steal, why I pay my taxes, why I do the, all the things that keep society going, I suppose it's a slightly irrational feeling that I wouldn't wish to live in the kind of society where people behave in the sort of ways that I wouldn't wish them to, be, to behave in, and therefore I shouldn't behave in those ways either. Now that isn't entirely rational because if I behave in an antisocial way, then that doesn't actually stop anybody else doing the nice things to me that, um, well, it, maybe it does, I and mean, that, that could, could be the problem. But it is a genuinely difficult problem why we are moral. All that I wish to assert today is that um, is that religion certainly doesn't help. Or if it does, I mean, if there's anybody here who thinks that they're moral purely because they're frightened of what God might do if they're not, I mean, that's a pretty contemptible reason to be moral. And, and I don't think we probably have much respect for people who only behave well because of the great surveillance camera in the sky. Um, <laughs> so I think that, that, uh, that I'm sure all, all of us here are, are moral for, for better reasons than, than that, although I quite agree with the questioner, it's genuinely difficult to decide uh, why, why we are. Thank goodness we are. Good evening, Professor Dawkins. Uh, my name is Thomas Lukowski. I come from uh, Thomas Jefferson's University, here to ask you a question. Richard, atheists have a PR problem. They are among the most distrusted minorities in the U.S. Many, e many people equate atheism with immorality and pessimism. They ask, what good has atheism done? Atheism is so cold, I don't find any comfort from those who do not believe in God. Some have attempted to answer these criticisms with new life stances, such as humanism or the church of reality. They assert there will, be, there will not be widespread apostasy until there is a replacement for religion. Sam Harris says, 
We must find ways of meeting our emotional needs that do not require the abject embrace of the, of the preposterous. Further, he says, we must learn to invoke the power of ritual and to mark those transitions in every human life that demand profundity, birth, marriage, death, without lying to ourselves about the nature of reality. So my question is, do you, what is your view of that assertion that there will not be widespread apostasy until we find a replacement for religion? Yes, thank you. That's an extremely interesting question, um, a very important one. If it is the case that people find consolation and comfort in religion, then I'm not in the least surprised, but note that that doesn't in any way imply that religious beliefs are true. What is comforting and what is true are two entirely different things. It's important to get that out of the way first, because there are people, I'm sorry to say, who can't tell the difference between that which is comforting and that which is true. Um, if you don't see the point, uh, imagine a doctor telling you you're absolutely fine when actually you've got terminal cancer. There are people who would wish their doctor to lie to them, um, but um, th those people who would not wish their doctor to lie to them should not be sympathetic to the idea that, um, that, re that religion has value simply because it is comforting or consoling. Now, the questioner quotes Sam Harris, as, by the way, I strongly recommend his books, um, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, both utterly brilliant books. Sam Harris um, says we need to replace the um, various roles of religion. Uh, comfort might be one of them, ritual might be another, uh, rites of passage, uh, marriages, funerals and so on might be another. To the extent that humans do need ritual and do need uh, public meetings to signal things like births, marriages, and deaths. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't put on secular equivalents of the religious ceremonies that mostly dominate our, our um, lives at the moment. Uh, I have myself organized one secular funeral for a very dearly loved colleague and been to many others. Uh, and um, what, what we did and what is normally done is to obviously dispense with all prayers, but you retain music, you retain poetry, you can have um, readings from the deceased person's favorite books, eulogies by people who knew and loved the deceased person. This is not difficult to arrange. It has the smack of sincerity about it in a way that Prayers, which are for all the same prayers for everybody, regardless of who they are. Um, the smack of sincerity comes from the fact that they're individually tailored to the individual who's died. Whenever I've been to religious funerals which have an element of the non-religious about them, religious funerals which include eulogies, which include the deceased's favorite poetry, etc., I don't know about you, but my experience is that the prayers fall absolutely flat whereas the eulogies and the poems are intensely moving. My wife even says, thank goodness for the prayers. They're the one thing that stops her from crying and, and keeps her um, <laughs> amused almost, rather than, rather than being sad about the, the loss of the much-loved dead person. The questioner is absolutely right in his preamble when he says that at least in American society, atheists are um, the least loved, least um, respected major group. That's something that's got to change because atheists are far, far more numerous than most people realize. And that's mostly because they won't come out of the closet. <laughs> it's obvious that in an intelligent, educated audience such as this university, I stress this university since <laughs> Who was
was it so who was it so fit to give them accreditation I'd like to know <laughs> in a place like this I have not the slightest doubt that there are a very large number of atheists and agnostics what is wrong with everybody in that position throughout the country standing up recognizing each other joining together and forming I won't say a lobby because somebody suggested that organizing atheists is rather like herding cats <laughs> they are on the whole too intelligent and independent minded to lend themselves to being herded but if a if an atheist lobby could be got together which showed a small fraction of its numerical strength it would outnumber for example the Jewish lobby which is formidably and notoriously powerful in this country there are more secularists agnostics and atheists in this country than there are Jews but do they have a voice in politics is it possible for an atheist to get elected to high office in this country no the Congress of this country is presumably at least partly derived from the intelligent educated wing of the country that being so it is statistically almost inconceivable that a substantial number of members of Congress are not atheists obviously many of them must be and yet not a single one of them will admit it they are forced to dissemble even to lie about their religious convictions because that's the only way they can get elected well isn't that something that the American electorate ought to be doing something about so I accept the question as premise and suggest that it's up to well I'm not an American citizen so it's unfortunately not up to me but <laughs> up to all of you to do something about it and to change the status of atheists in this country and to change the electability of atheists in this country. Good evening. My name is Amy LeMayham and I'm a first year student at RMWC. And Sorry, I didn't hear that. My name's Amy LeMay Hammond. I'm a first year student at RMWC. Thank you, Jessica. And firstly, I'd like to thank you for recognizing that there are probably many atheists in this room and that we are not morally dangerous or have no morals. Um, my question is in the case of sort of mock religions such as uh, the invisible pink unicorn and such, which I'm sure you're familiar with, do those help the atheist cause or do they actually hurt it by creating sort of um, hilarity about religion. Okay, they do, they do one good thing. They, 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 they answer one question, and it, it's a very important question because it's a very ubiquitous one. It's the following question. You cannot disprove the existence of God. Now, amazingly, there are a lot of people who think that's a powerful argument. You cannot disprove the existence of God, which somehow seems to suggest to them, oh, well, therefore, the existence of God must be about equally likely to the, to the non-existence. Existence and non-existence must be approximately equally likely. And the point about the invisible pink unicorn and the flying spaghetti monster and the celestial teapot and all those examples is simply to demonstrate that it's just not the case that because you cannot disprove something, therefore, that makes it the slightest bit likely. And so that, that, that's, that, that's the sole purpose of them. It is a very important purpose. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Dawkins. Um, my name is Zach Smith. Uh, I happen to be from Liberty University. And uh, I just want to applaud your, uh, your uh, atheist wit because I have never at the same time been uh, so insulted but amused at the same time. So uh, I just, just want to say that was a good one. But, um, uh, my, uh, I uh, have to forego my uh, original question uh, with the PR uh, state of uh, the atheist, uh, atheist that uh, you've you know 
imply that there's some kind of social justice uh, issue at, 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 at stake here by saying that it's you know, wrong or that, that ought to be. And that kind of language kind of implies that there is some kind of moral standard. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you know, from, from your perspective, what kind of moral standard could uh, be a basis for that kind of social justice if, if indeed there's no higher power? Uh, I, I just... Oh, well, um, first, I, I don't understand why you should feel insulted. I, I didn't insult you. I insulted God. And that's a very different... <laughs> Um, but, but then the, the, the question of, of social justice in the, in the, in the, in the rights of, of, of atheists to be considered citizens and to be considered electable, I don't think the issue is, is quite that they should be elected because they are atheists. That wasn't the point. The point is that being an atheist should not debar you any more than being black, to go back in history to being black or Jewish or Catholic or a woman or any of the other things which historically have tended to make somebody unelectable and no longer do, I'm delighted to say, um, that, that, that atheists and indeed homosexuals, um, but, which, are, which, are, which are the next one mo most difficult lot to get elected, um, <laughs> but atheists are the, are the, sort of, are, are the last major group um, to be embraced in, in, in this um, um, charmed circle of the electable. Um, I'm not saying they should be elected because they're atheists. I'm, I'm saying that, that, that they should be free to openly say what their religious conviction or lack of conviction is and not thereby instantly be unelectable. That, that's, all I, that, that's all I meant. I didn't mean anything more than that. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to say at the outset, I thank you for for coming and putting yourself, in a sense, on the firing line. And in so far as you've taken on God, you, you have um, always the opportunity that uh, God might win. So um, I, I would like just to call your attention to something that, in, in my hearing of your, your talk, um, you mentioned in, a, in a, the sense of ridicule about the Trinity and, and its affront to reason, very difficult to understand, even make sense of, and what, you know, why would a person even try, for that matter. But you, and interestingly enough, you finished your lecture with quantum strangeness, which in, in fact is the same problem for scientists as the Trinity is for believing Christians who have a need to understand. Just making that comment, um, and, and I'm recalled, I, I spent most of my life being an atheist or a non-believer in that sense, and I've seen the world through that lens, and I understand the logic of it, and, and so on. Uh, when I became a believer, um, I also noticed that uh, the same world out there was being viewed through a different meta metaphysical lens. And I would suggest to you that there's a burqa as well for the metaphysical reality. You can shift up and look through faith, or you can shift down and look through uh, human intelligence or, or human understanding. Call it reason or intuition or whatever. But I would call to your attention that there is a whole new reality that comes. It's not uh, supernatural in the sense, but it's a shift in understanding. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that's a very interesting point, and I, I can answer it with reference to how you began, which was the comparison between quantum theory, which is deeply mysterious, and the mystery of the Trinity, and you um, implied that there's a sort of comparability between those, that they are both. Um, deeply mysterious, so why should one prefer one over the other? The answer to that is actually very simple. Quantum theory yields experimental predictions which have been verified to an accuracy, number of decimal places, so accurate that the great theoretical physicist Richard Feynman compared it to the accuracy of predicting the width of North America to the accuracy of the width of one human hair. That is why quantum theory has to be taken seriously. And it doesn't matter, well, it does matter, but it's, um, one can take in one's stride because of the brilliance of the experimental verification. It doesn't matter that quantum theory is so mysterious that, as Feynman himself once said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. 
It is true that the human mind, and I believe the reason is that the human mind evolved in middle world, where the strangeness of quantum theory never impinged upon human life. It is true that the human mind cannot grasp, cannot visualize, cannot imagine the assumptions that quantum theory ne needs to make. But human physicists doing experiments can verify the predictions of quantum theory to a, an accuracy which is utterly stupefying and which leaves one in no doubt that in some sense quantum theory must be right. Nothing remotely like that could ever be claimed for the doctrine of the Trinity, nor, by the way, is the doctrine of the, tr of the Trinity anything like so interestingly mysterious as quantum theory. Hello, thank you for coming to Lynchburg. My name is Matthew Warner. I'm a grad student at Liberty University, and I have one, uh, one question. Going back to ethics and morality, you essentially said that the Darwinian uh, reason we have morality is that back in the day, you had cousins and people, and you wanted them to reciprocate. In order to act like that, you would have to make decisions. The decisions would have to be based on critical thinking. I was wondering if you have a Darwinian response or explanation for how critical thinking um, relates to Darwinianism. <coughs> Right, I think I understand you. You're, you're, wait, wait, the question is not really about morality. The, the question is about, is there a similar Darwinian account of critical thinking? Which is at the basis of your explanation for morality, in my mind. Well, and my explanation for everything else, presumably, as well, not, not, not just morality. Um, <laughs> well, um, I mean, crit critical thinking is, is something which um, isn't universally a, an attribute of the human mind. Um, it's, um, uh, I, I don't think it's very, very hard to imagine that, um, I, Im imagine ways in which critical thinking could have benefited the survival of our ancestors. I mean, I, I think that um, taking a, a rational view of evidence would probably have helped our ancestors to survive in a world of the saber-toothed tigers and ice ages and drying up water holes and all the other things which, all the other hazards which threatened life. Um, I would have thought rather the reverse, that the, the problem that faces us is how do we explain uncritical lack of thinking? Why is there so, such a lot of that about? Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I mean, I do have a chapter I explaining that, but I should have thought that was a, that was a rather harder problem than, than the one about, about uh, critical thinking. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Carl Swenson, and um, I'm going to tip my hand right off the start like the other brave questioners and say um, <clears throat> that if, if theories and ideas around things like intelligent design and creationism are scientifically all but dead, they just haven't fallen over yet. Um, then I see something else waiting in the wings scientifically that needs, that would, could be a problem for science. And that's, and so I ask your opinion about this. Um, things like, um, you've used the word mind a lot, we think of mind as some dimensionless thing in the middle of our head which tells us what to do and is separate from the brain, um, which is similar to the soul, another popular notion. So what does science or philosophy at this point have to say about um, this? About the, about the mind? About yeah, about the existence of it, uh, that or the soul or the popular notions of it. Well, I um, I mean, my, my, my view would be a materialistic one, not everybody's would, and, and my, my view would be that uh, mind and soul and consciousness and all those sorts of words are, they, they describe something which is a manifestation of the material brain and doesn't have any existence outside 
material brains, where material brains could at some future date perhaps include silicon brains, not, not just neuronal brains, but there has to be some sort of uh, physical medium, doubtless highly complicated, highly interconnected, a network of, um, of complicated wiring diagram, uh, which um, uh, by, by some means which neurophysiologists are now working on, results in the phenomena which psychologists study and which we colloquially give names like mind and even soul too. So I don't think that the mind is an immaterial thing that has any existence outside the material world. Um, I'm Archana Dutta. Um, I'm a sophomore at randolph Macon Women's College, majoring in biology and environmental science. Um, my, my question is in no way controversial. It's not intended to be so. And um, it basically springs out of what uh, the point you made in your hypothesis about God. Um, do you imply that we may evolve to become God, or do we share a common ancestry with God? Well, um, I don't think it's very helpful to suggest that we are likely to evolve to become gods. I do think that um, there may very well be somewhere in the universe be evolved beings which are so far advanced compared to us that we would, if we saw them, we might very well be tempted to call them gods. And it, it is also possible, by the same token, that if our species goes on evolving either genetically and or culturally for a sufficient number of millennia, our descendants might become so advanced that we would be tempted to call them gods. However, uh, I don't think I would wish to call them gods because however advanced they are, however ingenious, however intelligent, however um, their technology would strike us with awe, they would still be evolved beings. They would be beings that had evolved by a process of slow, gradual, incremental evolution. And that to me is the diagnostic feature of a god. A god doesn't evolve, a god just happens, a god is just there. And so um, I, I think my answer to your question is, it's an interesting thought, but, in, but, but actually I don't think it would be a helpful use of the word god any more than if a Stone Age hunter were to suddenly be transported into the 21st century uh, and would of course be awestruck by computers and mobile phones and Boeing 747s and helicopters and rockets to the moon, that Stone Age hunter might be tempted to call us gods, but I think it's a temptation that he should resist and so should we. Dr. Dawkins, I uh, am a professor uh, at Liberty University of uh, a non-subject, religion. Right. But uh, according to your book, and I've been reading your book, and it's helped me to understand atheist mind, and I appreciate that. I have a whole group of my students here tonight. They've been in the back there. And because uh, I wanted them to hear what you have to say, and we want to be careful not to set up straw men about atheists, which, you know, are done, and, and I want them to avoid Thank you that. very much. Okay. Yes, sir. But I, I wanted to uh, read from your book. You've been reading from your book, and right. I find it uh, interesting. This footnote on page 82, we might be seeing something similar today in the over-publicized tergiversation of the philosopher Anthony Flew, who announced in his old age that he had been converted to belief in some sort of deity. Now, I wanted to read that footnote before my question. Right. You would consider yourself a de facto atheist, leaning toward a strong atheist, category six, leaning toward seven. Uh, apparently because you would say the evidence demands your being an atheist, not a theist. For you, the evidence makes the existence of God highly improbable. So my question is, what evidence would you need to conclude that God's existence at least was as probable as that of extraterrestrials? 
And why did you relegate um, Anthony Flew to a footnote with, with him being such an eminent philosopher and uh, finding design in the DNA an indication of yes. deity? Yes. Um, Anthony Flew is a, a, is a British philosopher who has long been um, a champion of atheism and he has, as the questioner remarks, announced in his old age that he has um, been converted to a form of deism, not out and out theism, a form of deism where he thinks there probably is some kind of mysterious intelligence at the root of the universe. Many great people have thought the same. What disappointed me about Anthony Flew's reasons for that is that he publicly admitted, publicly announced, that what had convinced him was the idea of intelligent design and specifically the book of Michael Behe. Well, that doesn't argue for um, the surviving powers that Anthony Flew once had as an intellectual. Um, no serious thinker could possibly be uh, positively impressed by the arguments of the so-called intelligent design creationists. There may be good reasons for believing in a god, and if there are any, I would expect them to come from possibly modern physics, from cosmology, from the um, observation that, uh, as some people claim, the laws and constants of the universe are too finely tuned to, um, to be an accident. That would not be a wholly disreputable reason for believing in a, some form of supernatural deity. I think there's a very good argument against it, and I've developed much of my chapter four to, as I think, refuting that argument. If Anthony Flew had said that, then I think we could have a serious argument with him. But what he actually said was that he was convinced by intelligent design in biology. And anybody who knows anything about biology um, will immediately see that that is ridiculous. Um, I'm sorry, to be so, I'm sorry to be so harsh, but when I last saw Anthony Flew, he, he didn't endear himself to me because he actually went about promulgating the legend that Darwin himself had a deathbed conversion. And that really is a ridiculous story, which was long, long ago um, disposed of by the Darwin family. And it led me to... Uh, somewhat discount other things that Anthony Flew is now saying. He once was a, a great philosopher. It's very sad. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Ryan Thomas. I'm a biology major at Liberty University. And uh, I kind of have a two... I kind of have a... Sorry, I... I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my name is Ryan yes. Thomas. I'm a biology major at, university, at Liberty University right now. And uh, I have a two-part question for you, if you don't mind. Um, my first question would be, do you draw a distinction in between blind faith and reasonable faith? Okay. Um, is there a distinction? Do I draw a distinction between blind faith and reasonable faith? No. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that because um, just through, through my, my own studies, through, through my, uh, my investigation in, into this matter, I have come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as proof. Right. That uh, there is reasonable faith and, and there is blind faith. When I, uh, when I drop a ball uh, you know, to the ground on earth, it's, it's reasonable for me to believe that the ball will fall the very next time that I drop it. But I can't prove it just as I can't prove that you exist. Yes. I believe that you exist based on a reasonable faith because I can see you, because I can hear you. 
but our senses can sometimes deceive us. People on cocaine feel bugs in their skin, but that doesn't make it real. Uh, people that are taking hallucinogens see things, but it doesn't make it real. Okay. So I think it's interesting that you deny the, the line between reasonable faith. Yes, I mean, I think we agree. I think we're just using words in a different way. Okay. I, th okay. I think it's a, it's a semantic thing. Um, so, something like um, when, you, when you drop a ball, it falls, and when you drop another ball, it falls, and when you drop another ball, it falls. Um, I don't think I would wish to use the word faith for your belief that the next time you drop it, it will fall. I don't think that's what I would use the word faith for. I think that's, that's, that's normal science. I mean, that's based upon uh, Newton's laws. It's based upon a tremendous body of theory. It's based upon uh, scientific evidence. So I would not use the word reasonable faith the way you're using it. It seems to be you're using reasonable faith for um, basing beliefs upon, upon evidence. So if, if you're using reasonable faith to mean belief based upon evidence, then there's no disagreement. We're just using words in a different way. I define faith as, as belief that's not based upon evidence. Okay. And that's why I answered your first question in the way that I, that I did. I, I don't think we actually disagree, and I'm sure we disagree about other things, but I don't think we disagree about this in, a, in, a, in, that, in, 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 in an other than semantic way. Okay. okay. Um, then, then my second question, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't expect you to yeah. answer no actually to the first one. But, you know, yeah, there are surprises every day. Uh, my second question is, uh, considering then that we must believe what's based on reason, and, and reason, of course, is based on experience, correct? You know, reason is, is based on the fact that when I, the, when I drop the ball, it, it falls every time, so it's reasonable to believe next time I drop the ball, it's going to fall. Why then is it reasonable, considering our experience concerning the law of cause and effect, concerning the fact that we, our experience tells us that everything which has an effect has a cause? How is it that it's more reasonable to believe that the universe created itself? Because when confined to the natural laws, because nature is bound by its own limits, which, which are the natural laws, and if nature is bound by the laws which say that matter can't create itself, then how do you get around this issue? That there must have been something outside, outside the system. It is, it is very difficult. It is, of course, a very difficult question to ask how things began at the very beginning of the universe. It's very difficult to even know what the word beginning even means with respect to the universe. That any physicist, any biologist, any scientist, any reasonable person would accept. However, when you ask what's the alternative, if the alternative that's being offered to um, what physicists now talk about, a big, a big bang, a spontaneous um, uh, singularity which gave rise to the origin of the universe, if the alternative to that is a divine intelligence, a creator which would have to have been complicated, statistically improbable, the very kind of thing which scientific theories such as Darwin's exists to explain, then immediately we see that however difficult and apparently inadequate the theory of the physicist is, the theory of the theologians that the first cause was a complicated intelligence is even more difficult to accept. They're both difficult but the theory of the cosmic intelligence is even worse. What Darwinism does is to raise our consciousness to the power of science to explain the existence of complex things and intelligences and creative intelligences are above all complex things, they're statistically improbable. Darwinism raises our consciousness to the power of science to explain how such entities, and the human brain is one, how such entities can come into existence from simple beginnings. However difficult those simple beginnings may be to accept, they are a whole lot easier to accept than complicated beginnings. Complicated things come into the universe late as a consequence of slow, gradual, incremental steps. God, if he exists, would have to be a very, very, very complicated thing indeed. So to postulate a God as the beginning of the universe, as the answer to the riddle of the first cause, is to shoot yourself in the conceptual foot because you are immediately postulating 
something far, far more complicated than that which you are trying to explain. Now, physicists cope with this problem in various ways, which may seem to you, they even seem to me, somewhat unconvincing. For example, they suggest that um, our universe is but one bubble in a foam of universes, the multiverse, and each bubble in the foam has a different set of laws and constants. And by the anthropic principle, we have to be, since we're here talking about it, we have to be in the kind of bubble with the kind of laws and constants which are capable of giving rise to the evolutionary process and therefore to creatures like us. That is one current physicist's explanation for how we exist in the kind of universe that we, that we do. It doesn't sound so shatteringly convincing as, say, Darwin's own theory, which is self-evidently very convincing. Nevertheless, however unconvincing that may sound, it is many, many, many orders of magnitude more convincing than any theory that says complex intelligence was there right from the outset. If you, if you have problems seeing how matter could just come into existence, try thinking about how complex intelligent matter or complex intelligent entities of any kind could suddenly spring into existence. It's many, many orders of magnitude harder to understand. Sorry, you've had three already. <laughs> My name is Amber Moore. I'm from Liberty University as well. I have two questions for you. How can you believe in extraterrestrials as a higher being and not believe in a god? Could you just say that again? How can you, <laughs> how can you believe as extra, extraterrestrials as a higher being and not believe in a god? How can I believe that an extraterrestrial is a higher being and not believe in them as, a, as an advanced higher being. Yeah, I understand okay. um, the words of your question. Um, <laughs> an extraterrestrial higher being, if one exists, comes into existence as the end product of a long, slow, gradual, incremental process of evolution, just like the one that gave rise to us. That's the explanation for why the extraterrestrial, if it is indeed an advanced being, is an advanced being. It's a very sensible, easy to understand explanation. It's a gradual explanation. You start from simple beginnings and you work up. God isn't like that. God is a being that is not supposed to have evolved. God is a being that has always existed and therefore does not have the benefit of that kind of sensible, rational, gradualistic explanation. That is an absolutely crucial difference. I suspect that on other planets there probably are beings, as I said before, which are so far advanced relative to us that they might as well be gods except for this one absolutely crucial respect, that they came into the universe by slow, gradual degrees. They didn't just happen. Nothing as complicated as that just happens. They didn't just happen and therefore they or it or he or she could not be responsible for designing the universe. Okay, my last question. <laughs> this is probably going to be the most simplest one for you to answer, but what if you're wrong? Well, what if I'm wrong? I mean, anybody could be wrong. We could all be wrong about the flying spaghetti monster and the pink unicorn and the flying teapot. Um, <laughs> You happen to have been brought up, I would presume, in the Christian faith. You know what it's like not to believe in a particular faith because you're not a Muslim, you're not a Hindu. Why aren't you a Hindu? Because you happen to have been brought up in America, not in India. If you'd been brought up in, Indo in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were brought up in, in um, Denmark in the time of the Vikings, you'd be believing in Wotan and Thor. If you were brought up in, in classical Greece, you'd be believing in, in Zeus. If you were brought up in... Central Africa, you'd be believing in the great juju up the mountain. I mean, there's no particular reason to pick on the Judeo-Christian God in which by the sheerest accident you happen to have been brought up and, and ask me the question, what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong about the great juju at the bottom of the sea? <laughs> Uh, 
in continuation of the last fellow's questions, uh, <laughs> the problem is that you're applying natural laws to God, whereas he claims to exist outside of them. Therefore, he does not necess necessitate a beginning, unlike matter, on the other hand, which, ne which necessitates a beginning. Well, isn't that just too easy? I mean, you... <laughs> You talk your way out of having to provide a rational argument by just decreeing by fiat that God, that, that God simply de declares himself outside matter and therefore doesn't need the same kind of, of argument as, as anything else. I mean, if you're convinced by that kind of thing, you're welcome. My name is Kay Goodman, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether or not there is a God or gods. What effect has it upon humankind, upon the orders of the world, upon men and women, that we rather consistently refer to God as a male? Well. I, that's a perfectly fair point, uh, and um, I, um, I mean, to, to me, to me there, there is no difference between a non-existent male and a non-existent <laughs> female. Um, to the extent that, to the extent that God or gods has sociological, psychological, political significance, then I could easily imagine that um, if one could somehow begin a cult of a female god, it might well have a very improving effect upon human society. I'm nervous. Amber Dawn, student here at Randolph-Macon. Um, thank you for that previous answer. Um, I'll give you a bit of reprieve. I am not challenging you in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I only wrote this down because I know I'd forget what I wanted. As someone coming from a religious family, especially in an area with such a dominant religion and a particular figurehead, how does someone find their own way when leaving is not quite an option? Uh, I didn't quite the last sentence. Last. <laughs> how does one find their own way when leaving just yet is not quite an option? Okay. Um, First, and I have a small... I think this is a very serious question because I've had, I've had letters from really quite a lot of people, in, especially in America, and they say things like, I, I'm actually an atheist, but I daren't admit it. Um, I'm frightened of my family, I'm frightened of my parents, um, I'm frightened of my minister. Um, I read an article the other day about a boy in a, t a small town in Texas who didn't want to be confirmed. And the priest said, well, that's okay. You don't have to be confirmed, but you have to write down your reasons for not being confirmed. Why did the boy have to write down his reasons for not being confirmed into that particular church? He didn't have to write down his reasons for not being bar mitzvahed as a Jew. It just so happened that he was born into a Christian family, and therefore the presumption was made that he'd better have a good reason for not being confirmed into the religion of his parents or else. And that's one of the main problems we have, is the assumption that our society makes, regardless of whether we are religious or not, we all buy into the convention that children belong to the religion of their parents. You will see newspaper articles talking about Christian children and Muslim children and Jewish children, children who may be as young as three or four years old and who are therefore obviously much too young to know what their beliefs are about the cosmos and humanity and religion. There is no such thing as a Christian child. 
there is only a child of Christian parents. Whenever you hear the phrase Christian child, or Muslim child, or Protestant child, or Catholic child, the phrase should grate like fingernails on a blackboard. Just as the feminists have raised our consciousness to phrases like one man, one vote. You can't hear that phrase now without sort of at least wincing slightly because you realize it should be one person, one vote. At present, we haven't had our consciousness raised about the labeling of children with the religion of their parents. That's just one aspect, and it shows itself, to return to the questioner, it shows itself in a great deal of difficulty that any young person has, indeed any person of any age has, in departing from the religion of their parents, their social group, their grandparents, their uncles and aunts and so on. It might be a bit like getting divorced. I mean, it's sort of something that r raises um, real social problems. There's a magnificent one-woman show by the comic actress Julia Sweeney called Letting Go of God, in which she describes her own journey from Catholic upbringing to the mature and balanced atheist that she is today. <laughs> and she describes the difficulty of admitting to her family that, that she had become an atheist. It actually was reported in, in, the, in a newspaper, and her mother read it and screamed down the telephone. And Julia Sweeney, it's very witty, a very funny performance she, she does. She says um, that her mother was absolutely horrified. Not believing in God was one thing, but an atheist? <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. The, I mean, the, the, the precedent of, of, of gay people is one that one can vaguely bear in mind. I mean, uh, homosexuality is now much, much more accepted in our society than it was when I was young. Uh, when, I mean, homosexuality was actually illegal in Britain up until, I think, the 1960s, believe it or not. Um, and uh, the great British mathematician, one of the two fathers of the modern computer, Alan Turing, um, who arguably, because of his brilliance in solving the German Enigma codes in the Second World War did more to win the Second World War than either Churchill or Eisenhower. Alan Turing was arrested for homosexual behavior in the 1950s and was um, essentially driven to suicide. Uh, that has now changed and now people can be openly gay. The word gay has become a, a word used with pride rather than with shame. Uh, I think that we do have to have a, a shift in social attitudes to atheism, which will um, mirror that towards homosexuality. Um, it is, after all, just a view about the cosmos and about um, various other things, about humanity, about morality. It is really quite extraordinary that somebody's view about such an academic matter as whether there exists a supreme intelligence should reflect upon their, um, the way they're looked at in society, the way their family and their friends look at them. It is quite remarkable that that should be the case. Once again, it's something we've all got to do something about. Um, last question, very simple. Is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the deconditioning process of their parents' religion? I, I didn't, I think you're too close to the microphone. I said, is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the deconditioning process of their parents' religion? Um, is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the a deconditioning process from their parents' religion? I don't know. Um, uh, I, I, it had never occurred to me. Um, does anybody else have personal... Um, um, 
I, I, I think sort of fear is, is probably more common. I mean, fear, fear of, of um, w what their parents are going to think r rather than anger, but, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm, I'm interested in that. If, if that's, that question is based on personal experience, I'd be interested to hear more. Is, 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 is that a common experience? Yes. Yes. Wow. Ang anger on the part of the person who is undergoing the deconversion themselves? Yes. Anger against whom or what? The entire process. Having heard that clergy people, all of the authority figures who pushed this as a norm, which was anathema to the child's reason. Right. Well, thank you. That's extremely interesting. I've learned something this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron. I'm Ron Feynman. I love physics. Um, two, two quick, two questions, if I may. Uh, at Liberty University, they have uh, on display some fossils that they say are. I might be off by a factor or by a thousand years or so, but they say these fossils of dinosaurs are 3,000 years old, maybe 4,000, maybe 5,000. <laughs> My, my question, the first question to you is, what, what could they do to, to really prove to a scientist that those fossils are indeed um, that old only? Um, that's number one. And then number two, uh, would you be willing to elucidate a little bit further your um, arguments against creation by design and maybe give us some better sense of cosmological time, just how long it really is. Right. Um, the, the belief that dinosaurs are only 3,000 years old and uh, that the, the universe is only 6,000 years old, how to give an idea of the real time span um, of the world when what, one way to put it, which I've recently been think, thinking about, is that if somebody believes that the world is only 6,000 years old, or of the order of a few thousand years old, when the true age of the Earth is um, of the order of a few billion years old, that means they're out by a factor of a million, um, which is not a trivial error. Uh, <laughs> It's, I mean, I, I am not very good at, at, uh, at arithmetic, and I calculated that it's equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 700 yards. <laughs> uh, but I received a letter from um, a, ma a mathematician who'd done, his, done the sum again, and he said I got it wrong. It's actually equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 28 feet. Um, Either way, it gives you an idea of the scale of the error. Uh, the questioner asked, what would uh, the um, people of Liberty University have to do in order to demonstrate that these d dinosaur fossils really were 3,000 years old? Well, what they would have to do is to find igneous rocks, which uh, were found in proximity to or sandwiching the, the fossils, and date these by radioactive dating several different, half a dozen at least, different forms of radioactive dating, all of which give independent estimates of the date of these fossils. And all those different methods of doing it should point to an age of 3,000 years. In fact, of course, what they, those methods of dating all show is that dinosaur fossils are hundreds of millions. Well, no less than 65 million years old. Not just one method of radioactive dating, lots and lots of different methods of radioactive dating, different clocks, clocks working on completely different principles that, that all point to the same order of magnitude of age of these dinosaur fossils. If it's really true that the museum at Liberty University has uh, dinosaur fossils which are labelled as being 3,000 years old, then that is an educational disgrace. <laughs> it is debauching the whole idea of 
a university. And I would strongly encourage any members of Liberty University who may be here to leave and go to a proper university. elucidating on um, chance versus uh, natural selection versus uh, intelligent design and give us a sense of right. cosmological time. Um, chance and natural selection and intelligent design. One of the biggest fallacies in popular understanding of Darwinian evolution by natural selection is that it is a theory of random chance. It is not. It's the, it's the very opposite, and this is one of the most important things to understand about it. Um, uh, there is a, a certain chance element in it. The mutation is a, is a process of random chance. It's random with respect to improvement. Things don't tend to get better as a result of mutation. The important step in the Darwinian theory of evolution is natural selection. Natural selection is a non-random process. Natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly varying genetic codes. And the reason why some genetic codes survive better than others is their phenotypic effects via the processes of embryogenesis on phenotypes, on bodies, uh, which make them survive or not survive, reproduce or not survive. And the ones that do survive and reproduce pass on the genetic coded instructions that built them and equipped them and made them good at surviving and reproducing. That's the idea. Um, that is the explanation for the apparent adaptive design, the, 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 the illusion of design which all living things show. It is a non-random process. It does not involve design of any sort. Um, it produces an illusion of design. It is hard for people to grasp for various reasons, and one reason the questioner has pinpointed is the sheer length of time involved. Geological time is larger than most human minds are capable of grasping. Um, one of the various metaphors have been used to um, convey the sheer magnitude of geological time. One that I like, which I didn't invent, is you hold out your hand to represent the um, the, the length of geological time, and if, say, the middle of my tie is the origin of life and the tip of my finger is the present, then the dinosaurs, which went extinct 65 million years ago, um, lived about there. Most of this is bacteria. You have, um, you have um, multicellular life evolving about here, dinosaurs about there, humans at my fingernail, and the whole of recorded human history Everything from the Egyptians, biblical times, the Romans, the Assyrians, the Greeks, all of human history disappears in the dust from one stroke of a nail file. That's the, the scale of human history, is, is the dust from one stroke of a nail file on the same scale as the time that's available, that has been available for evolution. That is one of the reasons why people find it so hard to understand. There are many reasons. I've written about eight books on the subject um, which um, preceded The God Delusion, and it, it's a little hard to condense it into a few minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know when we're supposed to stop, and I... We want to, Professor Dawkins is going to sign books for us after this down in Ribble Lounge, which is downstairs, to give him a few minutes to get there. But I think we probably better stop here, here for this evening. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you.